No matter how many times we hear these parables, they always have the power to disturb us. No matter what we might learn about them, the context of their cultural assumptions of the original audience or the way that parables are intended to be ironic or subversive, these parables of Jesus and Matthew always have the ability to make us cringe. Tell me you didn't squirm in your seats a little bit as you heard that story. Now, as one who has studied these parables, and whom you have chosen to help you make sense of them, I could attempt to save this parable for you. I could tell you I think it's totally faithful to read this parable with the understanding that the greedy, harsh master is actually the master of this world, seeking nothing but money and power. That the two favored servants play the master's game and do as he expects, and although they're rewarded, in the end, they only serve to enrich their master, not themselves. The, the third slave, the one who refuses to enable his master's worship of wealth and instead does the honorable thing by giving the money back, that this slave maybe is Jesus, crucified outside the city uh, where it, when the sun refused to shine and where there was at least presumably some weeping and gnashing of teeth by those who loved him. I could tell you that as readers of this gospel, we know that he is vindicated on the third day, shown to be righteous, whatever that greedy master might say about it. I could give you this interpretation and make this story more palatable for you, but I won't. I won't because although I think that this is one good and faithful way to read this parable, I also don't think that that's why Matthew is telling the story in this way at this time. I think it's always our temptation to try to tame these wily parables, to domesticate them and help them, help them, help, help them serve us, make us feel more comfortable. But the simple truth is that neither these parables nor the God of whom they speak are safe. In C.S. Lewis's classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you may remember that before Lucy meets Aslan for the first time, she asks her guide, Mr. Beaver, if Aslan is safe. To which Mr. Beaver replies, Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. These stories are not intended to make us feel safe. They're intended to unsettle us. They're intended to impress upon us the gravity of our situation. The prophet Zephaniah criticizes the people who say, The Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Those people who believe that God either doesn't care what we do while we wait for the day of the Lord, or that God is somehow unwilling or unable to save us from the very real dangers present in life. These stories are intended to disturb us to make us sit up and pay attention, to, to make our ears tingle, as the prophets would say. They're intended to remind us that the God we serve is not safe, but also that God is good. As we read Jesus' parable, we might be dismayed that it kind of sounds like God appears to be like this greedy and harsh master. But I can't help but wonder if maybe Jesus' point is that even a greedy and harsh master can reward those who are faithful. If a sinner like that could do that, how much more abundant will God's blessings be for those who are faithful to God? The stories told by Jesus and Zephaniah and Paul are all intended to remind us that the day of the Lord is coming. And that what we do while we wait for it is important. In a couple weeks, Thanksgiving is coming. And every year at this time, I, I remember uh, our first Thanksgiving year, six years ago. It was maybe our first or second week here, even in town, and our house was broken into. A thief literally came in the night. Had we known to expect him, we would have been ready. After that happened, I spent weeks 
lying awake thinking about how I could be ready for the next time. All of the uh, gadgets and the sensors and the alarms I can wire up and hook to my phone and whatever else to prevent another break-in. But during those weeks, I also thought about what I would have done to that thief had I caught them in the act. My thoughts were not filled with pleasant things. During those weeks after the burglary, I was made painfully aware of the darkness that lurks in my own soul. It's that darkness that clouds our sight of the day of the Lord. It blocks our vision of God's reign and allows us to see only what's in right in front of us. The fear, the anger, the pain that the world can cause us. All those things that the world can take away from us. It tempts us to place our trust in our own ability to fight evil with force or violence or to resist it with technology, to rely solely on human measures of keeping order. It's not that those things are bad, but if we place our ultimate trust in those things for peace and security in this world, we're going to be sorely disappointed when all of those things that we've come to rely on are swept away to make room for the new thing that God is doing. That darkness I saw in myself, that darkness exists in all of us. But Paul reminds us that we do not belong to that darkness, that it does not own us, we do not serve it, because we belong to the daylight, the daylight of God's reign. We have seen the seal of God's promise of redemption and salvation for all creation in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The light of God pierces the darkness so that we can see what lies ahead, so that we can perceive what is coming and prepare for it. The way of God seems like foolishness to us. It seems unable to protect us from danger and distress, from literal thieves in the night. But the promise of God is that day is soon coming when the world will be under God's reign, when justice and mercy and peace will be the law of the land. And when that day comes, those of us living in darkness will be dismayed as everything in which we have placed our trust, all of the, the gadgets and the gizmos, all of the threats of violence and force, all of the structures of our society, all those things are swept away. No more war, nor capitalism or communism or socialism or any other kind of ism to keep us safe and comfortable. No more threat of violence to protect us from those who would do us harm. No more will we be able to depend on our own strength or skill to gain wealth or success or comfort for ourselves. If those are the things upon which we have come upon which we depend, then that day will be a day of great gloom and distress. But for those of us who belong to the day, who have seen in the faint light of Christ that this day is coming, and have lived according to that faith while we have waited, the sweeping away will not be a cause for distress, but for joy. Joy because we know that even the destruction of everything we know and love is not the end of the story. It's rather the beginning of a new story, something, a story that's even better. To live as people of the day, now, in the midst of the night, is foolishness. It can't protect us from thieves or burglars. It can't save us from madmen with guns or hostile nations with armies. It can't sweep away pandemic. It can't offer us the peace and the security we crave. And yet, Paul reminds us, somewhere else, that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. That true life is more than peace and security. The life that God has in store has none of these things that we've learned to depend on for our peace and our security. And yet we still trust in God's promise that that life will be one in which all tears are wiped away. 
a life in which death and crying and pain are no more, a life in which justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The oracles of Zephaniah and the parables of Jesus remind us that this God we serve is not safe. That when this God comes to establish this re God's reign on earth, nothing will, in all of creation will be safe from God's creative and redeeming work. For those of us who place our trust in human power structures and the work of our own hands, for those of us who choose to bury our riches in a hole in the ground in hopes that it will be safe, this is very bad news. But for those of us who belong to the day, who look with hope to see what the Lord is doing, who believe in the promise of life that God is bringing, we can rejoice in knowing that whatever death and destruction may come to us now is only a prelude to the new life which awaits us under God's reign. We risk everything when we invest all that we have in this reality that we can't even see, this reality which is not yet evident. But the promise of God is that instead of being disappointed, we will have a full return on that investment, a full return with interest to spare. That's the promise with which we support and encourage one another while we wait for the day of the Lord. And so, yeah, this parable maybe unsettles us, but maybe that's a good thing because we need to be unsettled if we're ever to look beyond the darkness that surrounds us and perceive the faintest glimpse of the dawn of the day of the Lord over the horizon.